So I want to talk about the future of censorship because a lot of us were championing last week when Trump was deplatformed from Twitter and Facebook, right? And I mean, I'll be honest, like when I first saw that, it made me laugh. It did. I, I, I thought it was kind of comical, you, you know, because I was like, well, this is hilarious because what the fuck is he going to do? <laughs> you know, like his main form of communication is fucking God. Like, I, I wonder if he's losing his shit uh, somewhere in, in the Oval Office or he's like, we got to go to Mar-a-Lago. I want to start my own Twitter. <laughs> you know, um, but there are some very dangerous consequences to what happened. And we actually saw a lot of the dangerous consequences. Ron Paul got deplatformed from Facebook maybe a day or two after Trump got taken down. Um, and that's very dangerous. What, like what you're going to see is te the, these te big tech companies can change their community guidelines, hide it within their terms of service, which who's reading that? We're not lawyers. We're average people, right? So again, it goes back to uh, what Mike Gravel says, which is, we shouldn't be living in a in a world with legalese and all that shit. We should be able to read a legal document in plain English so that everybody can understand it. And I think that's what terms and services should be too, right? Like if Apple came out was just like, we're going to sell your data to a bunch, to Facebook, to uh, to Amazon, so that they can market to you based on these, you know, based on these purchases that you've made or based on what you've listened to, I think everybody would fucking freak out and be like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, but they're not. They're, they, they're surrounded with a bunch of legalese and, and nobody really knows uh, what they're doing. Uh, but if Twitter decides tomorrow that, that you know, certain left-wing outlets, that the only outlets that are actually giving out true news is CNN and MSNBC and every so often Fox News, that, I mean, that's kind of the keys that we've, we've given them now. That's the Pandora's box that we've opened up, is they can deplatform anybody at any time, as long as they say it, it goes against their community standards. And they can do that because they're a private industry and they can do whatever they want. And they're not regulated the same way that other uh, industries are regulated. Um, I'm, I'm jumping around my notes here is, but you know, Ron Paul got deplatformed about two, maybe three years ago, maybe it was, tw I believe it was 2018. Uh, I might be wrong about this, the, the date specifically, but I think it was 2018 where like 800 independent news organizations were just deplatformed on Facebook and then also on Twitter within hours of each other, within hours of each other. No warning. They didn't say anything. They just deplatformed them. And then when they tried to get a hold of somebody, they were like, oh, community guidelines. It's just community guidelines. Um, you know, and uh, I, it, there was very few people talking about it. I think Lee Camp brought it up. Uh, Jimmy Dore brought it up. I was talking about it a little bit. But then, the, then you know, nobody was talking about it because we were like, what the fuck did we do? So they all kind of rebranded and restarted from the ground up. And that's part of, again, that, I think that was a test run to be like, can we get away with it? Let's go after some of these smaller groups, right? That maybe only have 10 or 15,000 followers. And then maybe we'll see if we can hit some of the bigger ones. Um, now the article, uh, from counterpunch that I, that I, that I was reading has an, has an interesting, I want to read one of the paragraphs from it because it's very interesting, right? So let's look at that. Uh, it says, excuse me, that every tech company could work together to effectively block the president of the United States. However, much of a dangerous person as uh, he has become or always was is not something to take lightly. Real power today is not with politicians or the banks. It's with these new media and big data organizations who fundamentally transformed uh, lived conditions on earth. I appreciate technology and how it has uh, always been with us, but today it's different. Technology has become a new religion, an unmediated power that promises to save us from ourselves. The pandemic already provided these companies with such momentous conditions of possibility of changing the uh, the lived reality of this planet. They that now 
that we now uh, see even the most radical of thinkers and activists cheer them on when they assume for themselves the ultimate political power, the ability to take command of circulation of thoughts and ideas, however threatening, demands serious critical attention. And this is a, a very good point that this that the author is making on, on Counterpunch here. It has become a, a new religion of sorts, right? Politicians can't really go after it. Cambridge Analytica was a was a a, a big deal, um, basically revealing that one of the major reasons why Trump got elected is because Facebook ran ads with psychographics to sway people's votes, and that was done by a company called Cambridge Analytica, who specifically use advertisements and psychographics to to persuade people's votes. And they've done that in various other countries, right? We, we saw leaked um, footage, leaked documentation about all of this stuff. And what did Facebook get for allowing a company like Cambridge Analytica, which was paid for by a billionaire, Robert Mercer, uh, who, who was funding Trump's campaign? What did we see happen to Facebook? Almost nothing. Almost fucking nothing. Right? They, they called him in and they were like, so Facebook, you're a... Uh... My notes here tell me you're some kind of a website. Do you live in the internet, Mr. Zuckerberg? Are you an internet man? Are you is if I touch you, are you gonna evaporate into the into the fabrics of the information highway? Where is this information? I took I-495 to get here today, but the, I'm not seeing, I'm looking at a map. And I'm not seeing the information. That's all they did. They, they did fucking nothing to this guy, right? He only influenced a major election. He allowed an outside company from the UK to, to influence a major election. We have proof of that. And they were like, ah, you scamp. Get out of here, you goofy goof nug. Huh? You silly... You, you silly little Asperger's crazy kook. Huh? Look at you. I dare you to blink. Blink once. I dare you. That's all they did. They gave him a slap on the wrist and he was like, we'll be better. And they haven't been. My shit gets censored on Facebook all the time. I have like 3,100 followers on Facebook. And an average post might get, I don't know, uh, like 50 people. That's a fraction of a fucking percent. That's so crazy. YouTube is the same thing. I have a you know a couple hundred people on on YouTube. I'm one of the smaller channels on YouTube, but you know my videos will get shown to 15, 20 people. Even if I share it, it'll it the numbers will go up very slightly. Hey, this is the way that they've kind of been working around. Now they've gotten the ability to. Well, it goes against community standards. Oh, we don't we don't like what they're saying. We're we're gonna delete their entire thing. I already kind of had that happen to me before. Spotify owns this company called Anchor.fm. Uh, they slapped me with some vague copyright issue. I tried to figure out what the copyright issue was, uh, and then they just deleted my entire podcast. Gone, like fucking, I don't know, seven years worth of work, over five hundred episodes of of my podcast just disappeared, no explanation. And it wasn't until Lee Camp got on Twitter, called out Anchor FM for what they did, that they restored my podcast and then I moved it to a different location. Different little ways that they do this shit. What was the episode that I put up? The, the episode I put up back in March was that Tulsi Gabbard needs to be on the debate stage, which she did. She met all the fucking bullshit requirements. And that was the argument I was making. This is a new religion for people. The way we interact with technology is is relatively new, right? I, I don't think it's the newest thing. We've been doing it for quite some time. But now, because we interact with it so much, I mean, we're on our phones all day. I'm on my computer all day, right? A lot of um, news stories that I get are either shared with me by friends, fans, or I see other people talking about them. You know, and the, or sometimes I, a lot of times too, I get them from my email list. I sign up for the email list of things like Counterpunch and Consortium News, Truth Out, that that sort of stuff, right? The Intercept, um, and I, I and I pick up stories from there. But 
I mean, this is how the information travels. And tech companies get to control that information. They get to manipulate you the way that you want to. It's just like the Nier Tandon thing, right? Is how many people against Nier Tandon that don't like her, that that are on the same belief system as, as myself, saw that post? A handful at most. What it did is it directed all the traffic to people that are near attended stands and they were like, go attack this person. Facebook does the same thing. There was a couple months ago, I posted a, a, a video uh, talking about how Biden is a racist, right? And every, and a bunch of liberals came out and they launched into me about it. But that's who Facebook decided to show this post to because if you instigate an argument on these on these platforms, more people stay on it. They want these things to happen. And then somebody says something and they either get reported or blocked or deplatformed. So what they're looking for is a way to get excuses. Now they don't need that excuse. Now they don't need to go around all this stuff. They can just say, oh, we think that you know this organization is going to incite violence. We're going to take down this BLM activist because that's the next step. The next step is, is that you know um, protesters and activists that are actually for true change are now at risk of being deplatformed for saying that they're that they're anti-government, they're, that they're anti-establishment, that they don't like a political candidate, that we need to you know drive change. All of these things they they'll they'll program these key words, organize you know, dissent, all of this stuff, they, those might be key words that they will look for and use that as a reason to deplatform you. It's a slippery slope of getting there. Nobody should be excited that Trump is off Twitter. It's nice because now I don't have to hear liberals talking about Trump all the time. <laughs> That's like the only fucking silver lining I get from this is that I don't have to hear liberals just talking about, oh, did you hear what Trump tweeted today? No, because Julian Assange is, is still in prison. Who cares? Did he did he say he's pardoning Assange? No? Okay. Boy, if he pardons Assange, if he would have pardoned Assange on Twitter, I wonder if Twitter would have taken him down. And I think that would have really been the glaring light to be like, oh shit, I think we've given tech companies a little too too much power. Even politicians, like like the article said, right? Uh, politicians have to go through it. Trump got taken out. The, he's, our, you know, quote unquote, the great most powerful person in this country. Um, taken down from Twitter, right? So, so what's next? AOC. What if AOC gets taken down from Twitter for saying something? And you can make the argument that that he incited violence, and he did, right? He incited those people to go and and. Um, break into the uh, capital. We all saw that. I, I, I talked about it extensively last week. But ne but people like Nir Tandon are still on there. Nir Tandon said that we should go to Libya and take their oil. Like, she's still on Twitter. She, she said in terms of Syria that America is the only adult in the room. So it's okay for us to go in there and do what we want. This person is still on. How is that not? In, you're inciting a war. Like you're making a justification for war. On top of that, warmongers are still on Twitter. People that voted for the Iraq War that lied about it, that lied about Afghanistan, are still on Twitter. How are they still on Twitter? New York Times. I've I've witnessed New York Times have to make retractions. CNN blatantly lied about Julian Assange. Still on Twitter. Still on Facebook. Still on all of these social media platforms. People that deny healthcare are still on 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 these social media platforms, right? And and declining people's healthcare is uh, that de detrimental. People are dying left and right because they're either in medical debt or can't afford to go to the hospital, can't afford to get the medications that they need. And the people that decline Medicare for all and universal healthcare are still on Twitter, and they're responsible for these people not being able to get their medicine, not being able to get their healthcare. They're still on Twitter. How have they not been deplatformed? They're inciting violence. And now all people have to do is, is have a random characterization. Oh, I don't like that you don't like my favorite political candidate. And because you're calling them out on their bullshit and I disagree with you, I'm going to report you and get you deplatformed. 
that Pandora's box has been opened up. I heard somebody on the news the other day say that now they have to be consistent, right? Um, and they they do, the tech companies do, the, theoretically and idealistically, they should be consistent on who they platform and deplatform off their website. Now, going against community standards and citing violence, yeah, I think you should. You that's that goes beyond the First Amendment, right? That that when you call for for violence, when you say, "Oh, go and take down the Capitol and go attack the people that aren't going to vote for me and and keep me in charge," and say that this this election was good to go and blah blah blah. Um. Yes, I think that that is not particularly protected by the First Amendment. But he was saying crazy shit about Iran. I mean, <laughs> he he assassinated Qasem Soleimani. You, you know, like that didn't necessitate a fucking deplatforming. They haven't been consistent, and now all of a sudden we're like, oh, you have to be consistent. Well, they'll be consistent for you know, what, like, they'll determine what consistent actually means. If they keep changing their terms of service and their community standards and their community guidelines, then, yeah, they've, they've determined they are staying consistent, but they're staying consistent with an evolving set of rules. And they control how the rules evolve. It's nice that we've gotten some quiet on Twitter, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go around fucking um celebrating this the way that the way that i've seen some people celebrate this retin economics the internet is a series of tubes <laughs> yeah that's that's primarily what a lot of uh old people i i have no idea why why like these old fucking people were talking to zuckerberg you know, like why why were they in charge of interviewing this guy? I don't think they fully understand what what the platform they're using is. It should have been like it should have been people like us, right? To be like, yo, do you know what the fuck you did? <laughs> Let me talk to you about this. Like, we at least know what the internet is. Uh Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh please make sure that you hit the like button hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows, the Forkful of Noodles live virtual comedy shows. Uh, the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website. But if you're also on financial stable ground, you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets and bonus content. You can go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to, to make any kind of financial contributions. But if you can't, it's not a necessity. Most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.